Welcome to Concussion 101 from the Sports Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. John Martinez, and today we're going to be going over the basics of concussion, talking a little bit about the Zurich guidelines, as well as return to play issues after concussion. Now, the first thing to note is that in the United States, 50 states and the District of Columbia all have concussion laws on the books that apply to athletes that have been suspected of sustaining uh, concussion either in practice or in a, in a game and holding them out and also gives guidelines as far as return to play for those athletes. Compared that to 33 and actually I think now it's 34 states that actually have seatbelt use laws uh, in the U.S. Now here in California there's been several laws that apply to concussions in high school athletes. Uh, first one back in 2012 that talked about and mandated removal of any student athlete suspected of having a concussion either in practice or in a game and that parents were given a, a concussion information sheet to sign and review every year too. The next year in 2013 uh, a new law was passed that also uh, required training for coaches uh, regarding concussions and uh, concussion management and return to play issues so that the coaching staff would also understand why the medical staff was holding their, their athletes out. And then last year, another law was passed which extended those requirements, which back in 2012 just applied to public schools. And now those uh, laws regarding concussions also apply to private and charter schools. So the big rule which has been on the books is that any athletes uh, suspect of having a concussion, whether it's in practice, uh, in training, or in a game, needs to be removed from practice or competition for the remainder of the day. They can't be checked on the sidelines, say, oh, you're fine, go back in. Uh, they also, if they're removed from play, cannot go back in until they're evaluated by a healthcare professional and given a written um, clearance letter to go back in and yeah, I think that's one of the um, better choices that's made out there to make sure that these athletes are at least having someone with some knowledge and background in, in concussions and concussion management uh, reviewing their case and, and helping work with them, the family and the coaches as far as getting them back to, to play. Now there's been a, a bunch of guidelines that have come out over the last 12 years regarding concussions. The last one is Zurich in 2012, which is the concussion um, consensus guidelines and they'll actually be meeting again in Berlin in 2016 to review this. But again, their uh, kind of verbose uh, definition is uh, concussion is a brain injury and is defined as a complex pathophysiologic process affecting the brain induced by biomechanical forces. Several common features that incorporate clinical, pathologic, and bio Mechanical injury constructs that may be utilized in defining the nature of a concussive head injury include, and they kind of go through a little bit more. But essentially, you know, usually there's a mechanism of either a direct blow to the head or a blow to the other part of the body, which impacts force that's uh, transmitted to the head. So someone that's tackled um, hard and the head kind of uh, snaps back, uh, brain would impact on the inside part of the skull. Uh, causing your concussion. So we can look on this video, you can see how the head comes forward and, and the brain continues to move. Same thing if there's a side impact, showing again the brain moving back and forth inside the skull, which can cause your concussive sin, uh, symptoms, um, regardless of if they're actually hit uh, on the head. And really the thing to think about with concussion is that it's, it's more of a disturbance in brain function. You know, again, the brain, we say, uh, quote, is shaken back and forth. And the big take home, uh, which I think a lot of coaches had a misunderstanding, is that loss of consciousness is not required for the, the definition or diagnosis of a concussion. I think a lot of coaches used to think that, well, he wasn't knocked out, therefore it can't be a concussion. Unfortunately, um, we're trying to... Uh, to continue to educate coaches and, and, and staff and parents that, that that's not the case. Concussions primarily um, don't have loss of consciousness and more severe ones can, but just the fact that there was no loss of consciousness does not mean that the athlete did not have a concussion. And some other things that, that are not concussions, but again, I think get confused, uh, bleeding in or around the, the brain. So if there's an epidural or a subdural hematoma, uh, those 
uh, are no, those are a different neurological issue, or if the patient uh, or athlete has a stroke or a skull fracture or even a seizure, uh, those are not concussions. Again, it's you know, again more of a, a impact force on the on the brain, and it's not necessarily a structural issue. It's more of a functional issue. And again, if we kind of run down the list of uh, symptoms, here's some of the, the public service ads that are out talking about the different uh, symptoms that athletes can uh, experience if they have concussion as far as headaches, nausea, vomiting, uh, double or blurred vision, feeling as if they're sluggish, hazy, uh, groggy or foggy, uh, concentration problems, confusion, or just not feeling right or feeling down or a little depressed. Initial symptoms, as we just kind of ran through, uh, usually headache, fatigue, dizziness, uh, difficulty thinking, and in some cases, but again, in not all cases, loss of consciousness. There may be delayed symptoms as well with a concussion, which includes uh, sleep di disturbances. They may have insomnia with a difficulty sleeping, or they may actually be um, hypersomnia where they're sleeping quite a bit. Uh, changes in personality as far as increased frustration or agitation, uh, memory issues, which would include forgetfulness, uh, difficulty concentrating, and then fatigue uh, would also be a uh, possible delayed uh, symptom that we see with it. The sports that are risk of concussions for boys or for men, American football by far has the highest incident of concussions. But for the girls or, or women, uh, soccer uh, or football, as we call it in the rest of the world, is going to be their highest risk factor, followed closely by women's basketball um, for concussion. And what's interesting, if you look at the boys or the men, that American uh, soccer actually has a much less concussion uh, incident compared to the women um, for that as well, too. Now, management of concussions, the sideline management, number one, is that they need to be examined by some part of your sports medicine team, whether it's athletic trainer or the, if you have a sideline physician that can do that evaluation. And a lot of times we'll use the SCAT-3 form uh, to kind of give us a baseline uh, on these patients. And the SCAT-3 form was part of the Zurich uh, 2012 guidelines, which was a sport concussion assessment tool. And it's a two-page uh, form that you can go through that goes through not only symptom evaluation, but cognitive assessment some balance examinations, as well as the, uh, the Maddox score and the Glasgow Coma score. And typically, if we have someone who really looks like they, they do have concussion, we'll try to do this on the sideline. That's so why we have a baseline for them. Get asked a lot by parents whether or not any type of imaging is needed, uh, CT or, or MRI. And really, for concussions, it's of limited use, because again, this is not a structural issue. And if it's just a straightforward concussion, there should not be any changes on any of the neuroimaging. So a CT scan or an MRI isn't going to show up, um, show us any changes in there. Now, it is uh, good to use if you're trying to rule out a different diagnosis. If you have a patient who's uh, lethargic or comatose, uh, suspected skull fracture, skull fracture, or intracranial bleeding, then obviously a, a CT scan or MRI at that point would be warranted, but typically you'd want some type of change in the neurologic exam of the patient to suggest that further imaging would be necessary. Mm -hmm. Recovery from concussion, cornerstone is, and the foundation of that should be an initial period of rest until those acute symptoms have resolved. And that means both physical rest and cognitive rest. So that from a physical standpoint, no training, playing, exercise, weights, um, no exertion with activities of daily living as far as doing chores around the house. And I think the other part that we forget is cognitive rest. So no uh, TV, extended reading, video games, uh, texting, um, playing on the mobile phones, things like that. And the good news is about 40% of concussions are going to resolve over one to three days. So by 72 hours, most of these athletes should be symptom free. And the vast majority of meaning 85 to 90%, are going to resolve in 7 to 10 days. However, children and teens may take a little bit longer to resolve those symptoms. So if you're dealing with the high school or the, or the junior high school athlete, you may see that those, um, those athletes take a little bit longer to start the return to play protocols. And talking about return to play protocols, it's a stepwise uh, protocol that we're using 
to get athletes back. And it talks about um, looking at not only their physical, but their cognitive activity. And so step one, while they're still symptomatic, is that again, no training or practice. And we try to limit their, um, their reading, their studying, their schoolwork to also allow the brain to heal up from that concussion. <clears throat> Once they're symptom free, we can start doing a graduated or a gradual return to, to play. So step two would be the light aerobic exercise where they can do walking, um, riding on a stationary bike. But again, I'd caution that no weight lifting or other uh, more extreme exercise would be, would be allowed at step two. And what we're looking at, at this point is to make sure that they still are symptom free, that there's no headache or any other type of symptoms or concussions that flare up or return with the, with the increase in activity. Once they've been able to go 24 hours without any symptoms, you can advance on the step three, which is sport specific exercise. So we can add in the running drills, uh, again, if they're playing soccer, um, that no heading and non-contact would be the uh, important parts of this level. And again, it's more just to kind of get them back into uh, kind of the swing of practice and and see how they, they do. But again, they should not be a full participant in practice at step three. Step four, we can advance them to non-contact drills. So again, more complex drills if they're playing American football or soccer um, would include the passing drills, but again, no heading if they're playing soccer. And again, the objective for this is to see how they respond to more intense exercise, how their coordination and cognitive load uh, handles the increase in activity. And again, we want them to be symptom free for 24 hours uh, with step four before we advance them back to full practice. At this point, we're ready to give them medical clearance. Uh, full contact practice is allowed at step five. The one take home with this is that they should not be on any type of medications that was prescribed for the concussion. So whether on a pain reliever um, for headaches or if it's been a long uh, course, if they're on some of the other uh, neurologic meds that we'll sometimes use, they should, uh, should be off all that before we can allow them to really return to play. And then the final play, or the final step, is a return to game play. And again, they should be symptom free for at least 24 hours in between each step. Uh, and then if symptoms do occur at one of, the, uh, one of the steps, they need to go back down to the next lower level until they are symptom free again, and then uh, advance them back up by 24 hour intervals. Now we get a lot of questions about neuropsych testing for concussion. It's a very good adjunct test uh, or adjunct test because there's a couple uh, ways to test athletes out there. But again, that should not be the sole basis of management decisions. And again, it should really just be an aid uh, to the clinical decision making. One of the, the factors that's been uh, big in the news over the last couple of years as far as concussions and especially American football is a chronic traumatic encephalopathy or also known as CTE. And it's a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it was actually first reported um, earlier in the 20th century, 1928, seen more in boxers. And what they were seeing on autopsy were these protein deposits in the brain that uh, were believed to have been from repetitive trauma to the brain. But what's interesting, it doesn't seem related to the number of concussions uh, reported, and so there may be some other issues that predispose um, some of these athletes to developing it. But Junior Seau of um, the San Diego Chargers and Miami Dolphins and New England Patriots uh, and a recent Hall of Fame uh, inductee uh, was an athlete that uh, that suffered apparently from chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, other issue is prevention of, of concussions and. I think every year there's a new device or a new helmet um, that comes out that proclaims that it's going to reduce the incidence of concussions. And really, we haven't really seen any definitive um, data, really scientific data that can show that we have a have any type of equipment that will really decrease the uh, the incidence or the possibility of concussions. Mouth guards get um, uh, talked about a lot. Now, it may decrease the impact of bio biomechanical forces, but at least right now there hasn't been a good study that, that shows a decrease in actual concussion. So it may um, decrease the number of mouth or dental injuries that an athlete has. Helmets, uh, probably no decrease in concussions, but again, it 
will decrease or may decrease uh, head trauma, so skull fractures, and other more serious um, head injuries. But just to summarize, many different causes of concussions. The take home is that they, any athlete that's suspected of concussion needs to be removed from practice or the game. They need to be evaluated and they cannot return to play then that day if a concussion is suspected. They need to have a full medical evaluation if they're going to return to play. Most concussions and their symptoms resolve in seven to ten days, although again in our teens and our, our preteen uh, population, those symptoms may last a little bit longer. That there's a gradual return to play and return to school with a six-step um, gradual return over 24 hours for each step. And that concussions are difficult to prevent prevent. So I'd like to thank you for listening to uh, Concussion 101 from the Sports Medicine Podcast. You can find our podcast on iTunes. We have a much uh, more in-depth um, podcast on concussions that will be up on the iTunes website. And you can also subscribe and uh, get our weekly uh, podcast on sports medicine topics that are applicable to uh, the sports medicine team. Thanks again. I'm Dr. John Martinez.